November 18th. I'll call the board select the meeting order. Excuse me, Eli. Uh, huh? I'm sorry, John Feuerbach, the chair of Affordable Housing Trust. Yes, sir. I, I think I'm getting an indication that I need to open yeah. the, our portion of our presence here. Right yes, now. you will. Okay. You say, you say when. I'm here. <laughs> okay. I don't want you to go too far ahead. So, uh, so um, uh, first, uh, the usual announcements. Um, uh, first, this meeting is being taped by 1622 Studios for future broadcasts. Also being taped by Gail Hunter for accuracy in minutes. Anyone else recording the meeting is asked to notify the chair at this time. Um, <clears throat> And I'll ask that everybody take an, uh, this opportunity to put your cell phones on vibrate or silent or off or take your pick, but not loud. <laughs> um, so um, our usual item zero on the agenda is reserved for anybody who has any comment on anything that's not on the agenda tonight. Does anybody in the public have anything that uh, is not on the agenda that they wish to make a statement? All right, then we will move on to item one, which is a joint appointment of Chris Olney as the planning board re representative of the Affordable Housing Trust. We have Affordable Housing Trust members, and it is this point when Mr. <laughs> Borderbach, Thank you. we should call your approval order. Okay. Um, as the representative of Mentors Affordable Housing Trust, I make a motion to um, call this a public meeting for the purposes of the for the matter. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Approved. Okay. So, um, the bylaw for the Affordable Housing Trust stipulates that a vacancy, vacancy on the board has to be filled through a joint vote of the board selectmen and the rem remaining members of the of trust. Chris Olney um, is slated to become the new representative for the planning board, uh, replacing Conan Sullivan, uh, who's no longer on the planning board. Chris has been on the trust already, but as a moderator appointed member, Alan has appointed a new person jointly with the um, trust. Uh, so it remains for us to fulfill this formality of appointing uh, uh, Mr. Olney to the um, affordable housing trust slot. So uh, uh, I would take a motion from the board of selectmen to appoint Chris Olney as the planning board representative the Affordable Housing Trust. So moved. Got a second? Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And uh, now this will be your turn, sir. Thank you. Um, I make a motion to approve Chris Olney as the Planning Board representative to the Affordable Housing Trust. Second. Right. Second. Favor? Aye. Aye. Discussion? <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, that is uh, that. Um, I guess we could talk about other things, but really, that's uh, that's really it. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, Not that we don't want to stay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, actually, technically, you have to close your meeting. Oh, go ahead, Bobby. Make a motion to. Uh, call to approve the Manchester Affordable Housing Trust meeting. Second. In favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <laughs> this is in the process fine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> oh my gosh, six or five hundred notes. And number two, public hearing. Um, <clears throat> For conduit construction at Summer and Ocean. It's a national grid public hearing. Um, the request from National Grid to install 1,800 feet of conduit, two to four inches, starting at the intersection of Summer and Ocean Street. And I got a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Got a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? National Grid, if you could come on up and grab a mic. Sure, is there one up there for you? There is. All right. Tell everybody about the project. Savita Mahabir, representing That's National Grid. It is, I think. I thought I tested it. It's not okay. on? A little closer. A little closer. Is that better? 
I can hear you. <laughs> it, it is going through the speaker. I can have it. You're speaking very softly. Yeah. Uh, Sabina Mahabir, representing National Grid, 44 River Street, Beverly, Massachusetts. This is for an upgrade of uh, internal structures at this location for reliability and so forth. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I know that there's. Um, uh, questions from the public, so I'm just going to move right along to those. Um, Jack, why don't you? <coughs> sure. Actually, Jack, why don't you take this other microphone okay. and answer those questions directly as much as you can. We'll just make this as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. Jack Burke, 16 Ocean Street. Um, I'm not um, talking for all the neighbors. We have others here, and, but I did get permission to talk for Mr. Mrs. Singleton, and across the street from from me. Uh, so the questions are, uh, one, will there be any poles involved, adding any poles to this? No. Will there be adding any above ground boxes to this? I believe they are thinking of one. Okay, could you tell us where that is? Uh, that would be um, in front of number 16, I believe. Yes, it's a concern. Okay. Um, I think I could speak for singletons and ourselves, and Kelly's can speak for themselves, uh, that a flat box opening for poles would be fine, but it's in front of a 150-year-old wall that has absolutely nothing in front of it now and would be uh, an eyesore if there was anything. When, when you say flat box, what do you mean? I have a picture. This is a, a full-size box that's, that's already there in front of uh, Victoria Road. Um, this is a box that's in front of my house at 16 Ocean Street right now. And that one is a handhold? Yes, we have no issue with more of these, but would not want to see anything like that. There are, not, there are none now, and if you're only upgrading the conduit, why would there be a need to? We're not just upgrading the conduit, we're upgrading the, uh, the wires and the infrastructure at this location. Um, Is there another actually, location for that box? Actually, before you um, we go too much okay. further with the back and forth, maybe it would be good if you could explain the full scope of the project and the purpose of the project. We will be installing conduit because the existing conduit will not uh, satisfy the loads. Um, the wire that we would need to bring the loads up to date or to be able to manage the loads that have grown in this area. So this is covering <coughs> the entire group of properties from number two ocean on up to number 23 ocean. Correct. We're also going to be getting rid of some um, antiquated infrastructure, uh, which are in the manholes, which is why a junction box is one of the things that uh, was going to be going in. And is this addressing issues that uh, uh, residents there have been having over the past years? Yes. What type of issues? Um, outages and blackouts, things of that nature. What's the difference between an outage and a blackout? An outage is uh, everything going out and um, partial power, I guess, is what you would consider it. Uh, people getting low voltage. <coughs> okay. Um, any other questions about details of the project from the board? You did say you all were um, also um, changing conduit. So what is it that would require um, a box as opposed to a handhole? A handhole is only where we connect services. Uh, a transformer is where we bring primary into the area. Um, there is primary already in this area, but it's not sufficient. So we are upgrading that and bringing that the old antiquated boxes up to date. And those have to be above ground? With water issues in 
this area, mm -hmm. putting transformers in the ground um, really is not wise. <coughs> so this, so there's a, a 50 kV pad existing right around um, <coughs> Uh, in front of eight, uh, 14, mostly in front of 14 Ocean Street. That one's going to stay and get upgraded, or? Um, or is that one being? That's correct. That's correct. No, yeah. <coughs> it should not be much larger than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be that one and then the one in front of 16. <coughs> is it possible to relocate it? Does it have to be precisely there? Um, no, I can speak to the engineer and see if we can come up with a different location for that. Is there somewhere then the neighbors would prefer it be? Or to look at? This is, this is the area where you're thinking of putting that box according to the map. Okay. And it's right, it's right in front of A. Right, so I saw that, but where, where are you proposing it be? Um, if possible, be down by the fire hydrant. Fire hydrant where? At the end of the wall. Down okay, so. Further towards the beach. So it'd be lower then, in no. elevation, right? Not really. It's, it's right on street level. Yeah, I understand that, but the street starts higher and then goes down lower. Is there any issues with more flooding down in that area? <laughs> the, the fire hydrant is well above the flood plain. Okay. Uh, are there any other residents from that area here who have uh, questions or concerns about this? Yeah. Right. Can you take the microphone from Mr. Burton? Carolyn Kelly, 355 Summer Street. If you're replacing antiquated infrastructure, we have a transformer that is up against our house, okay. which we would we have tried in the past to do something about and never get any follow through. It's um, 355. Well it is it but we also but we get our um, we go up through Ocean Street even though that's a summer street even though we're Ocean yeah. Street up in Texas. Texas. Yeah. So I would love to have that put addressed in the project. I will pass that on um, there's also one at 20 Ocean Street, which is, so it goes from Ocean Street up to 20, and there's a transformer there, and then again up at our house, so. What's the distance between the transformers? I don't know. Well, if you're over 300 feet, you would need a transformer. Well, it's not that I don't want one, or need one, I just would rather it be um, put not next to the house, it would okay. be placed mm -hmm. somewhere in between our house and the next one. Okay. And do we need to have both of those? I'm not sure. It's more than 300 feet. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, so um, I would have to look at that. Okay. And I would like to have like some contact because we've tried to do this in the past and we never get anywhere with it. So since we're doing this infrastructure upgrade, I think it's a good opportunity to take care of that. So at some point I can get some contact information. That would be I will I'll okay. give you contact information. So I'm just curious. So you've been reaching out to National Grid for some, how long have you been trying to get a hold of them? Well, so at one point a few years ago, we a transformer blew and they were um, searching for um, where our transformer was to I think turn it off or mm -hmm. whatever. And I was given a name of someone, but when I tried to follow up, you know. So you've been happened. trying to get a hold of them for two years? Well, okay, know. so I did give up after a while, <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm back. <laughs> All right, well, well maybe a face-to-face -face can help yeah, with that. Right. Um, the gentleman whose name you were probably given, he has since retired. Well, <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. You're welcome.
Um, hold on. Do you have a comment, or were you just trying to nope. get a microphone back? Pass around. All right. Anybody else in the public have any comment on this particular um, issue? Um, Jack, I'm going to limit how yeah, far the, you go. It, it's just the issue, the issue seems that we're in favor of the upgrade. It's just a matter of the of the aesthetics of the boxes and the location of Mrs. Kelly's. Okay. So the issue, so now I'm going to ask uh, the, the timing of this project. Was this intended to execute this project rapidly before with the asphalt plant shut down for resealing the road? Are you cutting the road to get into, into this? Uh, we would be. Yeah. Um, that won't be happening before your moratorium. Okay. So we have time, in other words, already, regardless of what we decide here. Yes. All right. This is what I would like to do. Um, uh, I'm extremely reluctant to leave um, the uh, citing to of this particular um, tra transformer box and dealing with your transformer to an abstract kind of hand wave. What I would like to do is um, <clears throat> we'll take your requests and uh, talk to the DPW and have National Grid um, uh, propose any possible changes to this and we'll continue this hearing to a uh, future meeting when we can come back with a very specific suggested change. I'm not willing to make specific suggestions here without engineers actually having to say. Sound reasonable? That's fine. All right. Can I get a motion to continue this public hearing? We have to pick a continuous date. Yeah. Uh, our next meeting is um, December second. Uh, is December second enough time, or should we push it to the sixteenth? The sixteenth would work better for me. Yeah. I am not in the state on the second. Well, then let's do one on the sixteenth. <laughs> <laughs> Sound all right? 16th okay with everybody? It'd be nice to see you before the holidays. <laughs> Do you like your chief smash up by moratorium? Well, we don't let National Grid start opening up the roads too close to the time when the asphalt plants shut down because if they do... That's yes, me. Not the moratorium on Summer Street from the repaving from two years ago. No. Okay. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> All right. Item number three: public hearing on the fiscal year 2000 uh, fiscal year 2020 tax classification. So, um, this is not actually setting the tax rate for members of the public who are interested. This is um, specifically. Uh, we have the option uh, as a municipality to set a different tax rate for um, commercial versus resident rates, and that's what this hearing is about. Um, so uh, I will make a motion, or I will ask for a motion. Oh, wait. So moved. No, we're going back. Oh, no, no, no. We continue to preview the other public hearing. Don't have to do anything. All right, I'm going to ask for a motion to open the uh, tax classification for all hearing. So moved. so moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? My turn? Your turn. Hi. Jenny Thompson, Principal Assessor. Um, so you all got a little packet from me to, to look at over the weekend. I'm sure it really great, was entertaining. Great, great reading. <laughs> great reading, yes, exactly. Um, I will just go through all of it and then tell you what we need for votes and um, should be out of here quickly. Um, the first page is information on uh, for the this classification hearing. It basically just gives you updates on our total value for the town from last to this year compared to last year, what that increase is for total value, which was sixty-five million five hundred and twenty thousand eighty-two dollars. Um, proposed tax rate, you know, ta no tax rate is, is um, you know, it doesn't go live until it's approved by the DOR. So at this point, we're looking at the um, 
rate going from 11.23 to 11.70, which is 40 cent uh, increase. Uh, average single family value jumped from 1.1451 to 1.1786. The median single family value jumped from 7.512 to 7.664. Average residential value went from 106.23 to 108.17. Uh, average commercial industrial uh, last year was 7.449 and now it is 7.764. Average taxable value went from 1,006,000 to 1,038,100. The average overall value went from 944.4 to 972.3. The median overall value went from 650,700 to 663. Uh, example of a tax change for an average residential last year the taxes based on the 11.23 tax rate were 11,929.63 this year with the proposed rate and the increase in the average assessed value it would go up to 12,655.89 uh, example of tax changes for a median it would go from 8,435.98 to 8,966.88. Uh, last year, the increase on an average residential bill went up 536.74. This year, it would be $726.26. Growth, unfortunately, was much lower this year. Um, in 19, it was 276. This year, it dropped to 166. Uh, we've got to get people building. <laughs> uh, this is not a recertification year. That actually will be next year. Um, they, they've changed that law so that it's every five years now. Um, so we our last revaluation was in 2017. We didn't, we didn't get the full five-year push-out. We got a four-year. But um, we made adjustments based on 2018 sales for single family houses and we're required to have a certain amount of sales to change values so if we don't have enough sales in one category we have to do two years worth of sales so for every other class except for single family we had to use sales from July of 2017 through June of 2019. <coughs> Total increase in taxable value was a little over 2.5%. The tax rate increase was a little over 4%, which doesn't sound bad because they thought it was going to be 6 So, mm -hmm. um, As you can see from the above, the increases in taxes based on the average residential assessment is more than last year. Total assessment of the town, including exempt property, which you can tell by looking at this, we have way too much exempt property is $188 million, um, is uh, 2,697,178,938. And that is 69,787,382 higher than last year. Mm -hmm. And as I've stated before, no tax rate is official until the Department of Revenue approves. Uh, the next page gives a breakdown of um, what each class of property would be paying um, for the levy, what part of the levy they would be paying, and it breaks down the values by class. Residential, um, of course, plays, pays the majority. Um, most of our properties are single family houses, so 93.3848%. Uh, commercial at 4.1143%. Industrial at 0.2801%. And personal property at 2.2208%. The following page gets into if you decided you wanted to shift and have commercial, industrial, personal property pay more than residential. Um, it shows at the, the very top, it shows what the rate would do if you shifted by 10%, 20%, 40%, 50%. 50%. That's the max we can shift is 150. So um, 
as you see by looking at each of those categories, residential goes down minimally, minimally. <laughs> um, commercial and desktop personal property tax rate would increase um, more than what you'd see for savings on the residential. Um, <clears throat> the next column down just gives you a breakdown by class what would happen with the rates um, if they, if you did a shift. The residential, you can see what the savings would be, and then the commercial, industrial, personal, down the bottom, shows what the shift would do. The following page also does um, shift analysis based on the average uh, value of each residential, commercial, industrial average, and residential and commercial industrial with an average assessment. The, um, I've rounded them off to make it easier, but it also shows in the residential the savings that would be made the highest if you shift it all the way, would basically save $443.50, where if you shifted fully to the commercial industrial, they would be paying an increase of $4,541.94. Um, as as usual, the board of assessors, um, you know, if you if you shift to uh, commercial, industrial, personal, it also affects businesses and second homes on personal property taxes because there are changes for those also. And based on the analysis, the board of assessors recommends a single tax rate for all classes of property. On the following page. It talks about the residential exemption. Um, it gives you the amount of um, properties that, that would be affected, um, the, the value, the average value. Now, since fiscal 17, you can give uh, up to a 35% um, residential exemption. Uh, the minimum, maximum amount of exemptions is 35. Only properties that are owner-occupied get the exemption. Right now we have about 1,600 estimated apartment buildings, only the unit the owner occupies gets the exemption. Uh, the decrease in value for residential, if you did this due to the exemptions, causes the tax rate to increase, which in turn affects the other classes of property. It would have the same effect as if you were shifting the tax burden from to the CIP, commercial, industrial, personal except it would also affect everyone that is um, not owner-occupied. Um, we do not have open space, but that would also be affected if we did. The residential exemption is not recommended <coughs> by the board of assessors. Following pages, we have open space, but we have none, so we don't have to worry about that. If we did have residential, um, I mean, open space property, you have the option to also give an exemption for a certain amount to those also. And the last um, commercial, small commercial exemption, out of uh, 139 on the list this year, only 26 would qualify, and the rest of the class would have to um, make up the difference by a higher tax rate. So it's also like shifting back to um, anybody that doesn't qualify, then you have to pay the difference between the ones that do. Every property, if it's any property that's over a million dollars doesn't qualify. So, and if there's a building that has multiple uh, businesses in it, all of them have to qualify in order for the property to qualify. Um, and give up to a 10% exemption. And I did the analysis based on the highest 10%. Only an estimated, like I said, 26 out of 139 would benefit from this exemption and the remaining commercial industrial would have to pay more with a higher rate. Small commercial exemption is not recommended by the Board of Assessors. <coughs> And the other thing that I do need to tell you is the excess levy capacity for this year, um, we left a lot there. Um, 
$548,043.33. So what we need from you is a vote on shifting the shift, or if we're going to stay with one rate for all classes of property, uh, the residential exemption, the small commercial exemption, You can do them all in one. I, I think we've done them in one motion before, or do we do them in separate? I can't remember. No, we do them separate. Separate? Okay. So I guess the first one would be whether, you know, um, to not shift to the CIP. Do we, are we advised by Fincom on this? Fincom is, uh, to my knowledge, never. Uh, but we've had this discussion year over year, and FinCom has never taken a position opposite what the Board of Assessors has uh, suggested. This is this is the same story that we've seen every year. No question. Um, can you use the uh, where do where do properties that are doing Airbnb fall in terms of residential, commercial? They don't, because we don't know what they are. If they're a single family house, they have the right to rent it out anytime they want to. We can't charge a commercial rate or anything like that. If it's a single family house, it's a single family house. If it's a two family house, we would assess it as a two family house. They could be renting it yearly, they could be renting it monthly. So is a property that is not owner occupied and rented considered a commercial property? No. No, commercial property, it, if it's a single family, there's two family, there's three family, there's apartment buildings up to four units, and then there's apartment buildings that are four to eight units or higher, mm -hmm. uh, they're all considered residential property. So there's, I'm sorry, were you done or did you have, no so there's no distinction in terms of, of benefit to the town between a single family acting or somebody acting as an Airbnb or a property that is used for events? Well, events would be differently. If they were renting the property for for business purposes, yeah. then yes, that would that, that would could be looked at differently. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, what, what state law does new allow is that if you wish, you can place a local room tax on the Airbnb type rentals. But from a from a classification mm -hmm. and, and a property tax perspective, we're That's, not allowed. You're okay. taxing you're taxing the operations, not the asset. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's it's just like meal tax or any of that type yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And currently we don't have that in place. We do not. So that would take it's a local option. Um, so that's something that would be a, a town meeting vote. Mm -hmm. So we have talked about possibly putting that on at the April town meeting. We we haven't talked about it lately, but there was we, we did talk about, about it last year, though. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we did discuss that, yeah. Right. Any other questions? Arthur? Is, is, just out of curiosity, is, I'm just trying to understand the, the flow of the logic. Is the, Are you taking the existing tax rate and applying it to the adjustment on valuations? Because I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to... I'm, the root of, of all my question is just, it, it just struck me as the increase on an average homeowner is not insignificant. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of, with all, with all the great work that you've done, this isn't a comment, this isn't a question for you, it's more a question, I guess, for the town as to kind of, are we continuing to tax? We end up with a, you know, uh, excess fund that we're looking to manage 
Do we question the rate? What, what point do we question the tax rate? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, that it's only at 1170 because we left money available that we could tax up to the levy limits, which we do a lot, but we're trying to help the people this year because of the school add yeah. on also. So that's a question really of how much you want to use the local receipts, which has been the driver of our fund balance. Yeah. So, so the eleven seventy rate assumes that we are using um, following that 80 percent rule. In other words, take the last five years, take eighty percent of that local receipt number. So it's um, it's a good four five hundred thousand more in terms of local receipt estimates than we have been using in recent years. So if the tax so that's why you have that excess levy capacity. Right, right. So if things go bad tomorrow night, which we hope they don't, we'll just adjust. We'll, we're going to stay where we are with everything. We're just going to adjust back down the estimated receipts so that we're still at the same tax rate and still at the same levy capacity. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not criticizing Melissa. I'm just. Did that make sense, though? Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. I just. Yeah. I'm still trying to reconcile mm -hmm. a jump in $500 annually, which, you know, again, for your average resident, that's not insignificant. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's the consequence of the uh, us voting the, the school building. The new school. Yeah. yeah. That was my question. That was, yeah. It's the new school, basically, that makes it so much more. Which was already passed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I, I guess it goes back to this. I mean, it doesn't change anything. We're living with a little bit of a consequence because it goes back to the, you know, with the new federal tax guide, well, not guideline, federal tax law, <laughs> the, the compounding effect of not being able to uh, write off the, uh, right. taxes, property the local taxes. property taxes the way that you used to, it's, it's actually more than 500. It's, yeah, this is a lot more for people. Yeah. yeah, the effective value is actually mm -hmm. twice what the increase it's will be. 10,000 is the limit, is that right? Right. So anyway, it's just, I, I, I'm supportive of this. I'm just, uh, in, even in doing what we view the right thing, it's, I, I think for the average taxpayer, this is a, this is, this is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I guess what I'm wondering, we're not going to change it this year, but I'm just wondering like how we deal with this going forward. Because <laughs> I don't know if this is sustainable when we look at the average property value that we have. So that's, 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 that's going to be a topic of the budget discussion a little mm -hmm. bit later tonight <clears throat> and over the coming months. Mm -hmm. um, so before we, the process here is I'm going to ask for if anybody in the public has any comment or question on this. But before we do that, I'm going to just, just for clarification, the, the specific um, motions that you want to know. Okay, a motion to um, to maintain one tax rate for all classes of property. A motion to for no residential exemption. And a motion for no small commercial exemption. They also vote to accept the excess levy capacity estimate. They, is that a vote or is that? No, it's just me. I'm totally so unqualified. I mean, I'm the one that has to tell them what it is. Yeah, okay. There, there is a um, LA five sheet that that is on, and in the past you also have voted to give Greg the ability to sign off for you online. I still have all your usernames and passwords from last year, so, <laughs> and I created one for you. <laughs> um, they keep, I keep them in a very private area where no one will ever see them. <laughs> I do have one more question. In terms of the open space, um, is this the, the open space discount? Is that for developments when they leave open space? There's another class code called open space, um, and it it is you give a discount on it if you want to. Um, I think it's more of keeping land 
open and if you classify it like that but the town has never classified any land as open space if you do classify it that way um, then you the board has the option to give it a discount for that sure all right questions from the public I just want to be clear when yeah. um, Isabella Bates to Masconoma Street. I, I this is only for clarification. When you talk about these increases, does that reflect the decision to fund the new school, or is this above what we were already uh, increasing? In other words, is this like a double increase if you change the rate on top of? I mean, I forget last no, so year. The rate, this this projected rate incorporates that, the new debt service. On the school. Yes. Yeah. So that was, I wasn't clear about that. Right. So that's built into this. Okay. Thanks. And, and just to be clear, that we're, what we're voting tonight is not the new tax rates, it's just the tax classifications. Uh -huh. Whether or not we should have a single tax rate, um, whether or not we have to support uh, residential exemptions. That's all we're voting. And that's. The exemptions are income based, is that right? No, they're different kind of exemption. What, what how do you get I an exemption? No, I'm sorry, the, maybe it's irrelevant, right? The <laughs> resident or, or exemptions for like elderly and veterans and all that, that's done separately after tax bills are created and you do have to meet certain qualifications for that. This residential exemption is for people that are that live in their property, owner occupied. Um, some of the places that have done it in the past are like Brookline, Boston, you know, try to give residential exemptions to save people some, some money. Not a lot of communities give a residential exemption. Any other questions, comments? All right, I'm gonna take a motion to close the evidentiary portion of the public hearing. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. So now I would like, we're going to do three motions. I would like a motion to maintain a single tax rate for all classes of property. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And then a motion that there be no residential exemption on the uh, tax rates. So moved. Yes, second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And the third uh, motion for no small commercial exemption in the tax rate. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're done. We're done. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. So I assume you're okay with us certifying. Oh, that's right too. Yeah, I need to know that. Just on, on the on the recap in the um, LA five. The LA five. I just need to have five hundred forty-eight thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Just sign off that I did tell you that. That's basically what we're doing. So yeah. I used to have you ha hand sign. Now it's an online uh, program that I need to put your signatures in on. So. You want to vote for us, or just a verbal acknowledgement? To um, a vote would probably be good, uh, just so that we have it in the record. All right. So. Uh, <laughs> you feel disclose my password <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this would be a vote to um, uh, acknowledge that we have received the LA fifty report from the news app. Uh, LA. LA, LA five, five report. LA five. Yeah, and that you give um, either Greg or myself. Um, the rights to go on and sign sign off the you know. on yeah. So a motion that we have so I'll take a motion that we have received the LA five report um, and that we um, authorize um, Greg on to say Greg yeah because to uh, sign on our behalf online to recognize the acceptance or to accept the LA five report. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Okay. See you tomorrow night. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, there. Thanks, Judy. Uh, item number. Action.
actually, you know what? Yeah, no. Any objection to moving things around a little bit since uh, we have the Iron Master here? Yeah. And I don't think there's anybody else here really for item number four. Is no one from the National Bird? No. Did you know that this other item was here? It wasn't her. There was another name on that. Yeah. Wasn't there a male coming in on that one, I thought? There was a male's name. <coughs> At any rate, we're going to jump to item number five, updates from the Harbor Master. Um, Brian Pike, take it away. Uh, Brian Pike, name says the Harbor Master, President Harbor. Good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I guess the first thing I wanted to touch was on was the repark dock expansion and how that worked this summer. Uh, worked pretty well. Um, it was actually uh, an interesting uh, side bit that the park down there was busier than I'd ever seen it. Maybe that's because I was down on the docks a little more, but the, the docks were, were busy with um, people walking as well as tying up. And using the online means of collection, <coughs> we brought in about $15,000 this year with our training wheels on. Uh, got better as the summer went on, and we were pretty happy with the results. Um, we saw approximately 931 uh, one hour visitors at our dock this summer. And uh, we still have the same amount of one hour free tie-up that we always had. There's actually no charge for the one hour tie-up. Uh, 450 folks came and paid the hourly rate during the day. Then approximately 123 boats for overnight dockage. Uh, then uh, also while we're talking about transient vessels, we did a count, an approximate count for uh, Black and Long Beach beaches this year. We saw about 600 boats at Black Beach over the course of the summer and 1,800 at Long Beach. And while a lot, that, that was kind of a plateau. Uh, I would say we didn't see dramatic increase this year over last year. Still a lot of boats. Um, Speaking of Black Beach and, and the new boat that was purchased, Black Beach, Long Beach, <laughs> the new boat that was purchased to patrol, I, I feel pretty strongly that uh, it had a profound effect on the in and out in the harbor as well as the moving of the new wake zone. I thought it was safer out this year, out there this year. I had a lot of people comment that they felt that it was safer in the outer harbor this summer. Uh, we had fire and police department uh, folks on the boat with the harbor department. There were no tickets written by the police department this year. There were a couple of close calls with um, uh, potential boating under the influence, but uh, in both cases, the person didn't fail the field sobriety test. The uh, police department very much took a, an education first approach out there along with the, the harbor department. So I consider that a success. Um, there's a steering committee that's waiting for information from uh, firm Tetra Tech to uh, give us some information about siting of a possible uh, harbor office, visitor center, public bathrooms. Uh, no information to share with anyone yet still waiting for a report. Would this be a year-round harbor it master's would. office? Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it would be impractical to move files from one place to the other mm -hmm. uh, twice a year. I'd be nervous about moving yeah. that kind of paper, me especially, on a windy day. Some of you may know we had a, a little bit of weather in October, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, uh, we saw a lot of boats suffer some degree of damage. 24. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, 
either sails that were damaged, swamped at the mooring, broke loose from the mooring, uh, either a failed chain or, or failed pennants, um, which has driven the discussion on mooring standards, which Manchester does not have, hasn't had, uh, as far as I know, ever. So I spent a uh, countless number of minutes uh, copying, pasting, and plagiarizing <laughs> the Beverly Standards for uh, moorings. I made some adjustments with the help of our mooring service providers, the three of them, Yacht Club, Manchester Mooring, and Crocker's Boat Yard, to see if we couldn't develop something that would be useful for Manchester. This will come up at the HAC meeting on December 4th. And I suspect that uh, they'll come away from that meeting with a recommendation to bring to you folks, probably shortly after the first of the year. Was that both chain um, block and tackle, or the whole kit and caboodle, top to bottom? Mm -hmm. Will be size standards for blocks, for chain, and for the pennants, and uh, service standards as well. Did anybody get dragged, or was it all? One boat dragged. It was one Rhodes 19 with its really heavy 50 pound uh, bucket of cement oh. to drag off into yeah. Whittier Cove. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th one of the things this will address is uh, self-service mm -hmm. of moorings. And there's a, a fair amount of that, uh, particularly in Magnolia, where we didn't see any dragging, but we did see uh, one boat come ashore, uh, the cleat on the boat actually ripped out of the boat. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a vessel a hardware failure. Which uh, to the best of my knowledge, that's failure. <clears throat> right. Oh, uh, let's see. Question, I have a question for nine. Mm -hmm. I am actually, no? I think, mean, yeah. Uh, 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 the HAC will be discussing harbor fees as well at that meeting, uh, whether or not there's it's time for an increase. I think it's been four years. So uh, that'll be a discussion. And an ongoing discussion will be uh, a long-term plan for the harbor. Uh, we've done a lot in seven years. There's been uh, a lot of improvements, upgrading, changes, and uh, Discuss, uh, discussions whether or not we should slow that, that down a little bit and, and focus on dredging, getting that piece uh, finished up. And uh, obviously, uh, a harbor office is, would be another big change that uh, is in the pipeline. But uh, just sort of a long term, deep breath, deep dive look at whether or not the harbor should be going in more directions. And then dredging, um, there's been a lot of discussion. The dredging committee's been meeting and doing some good work uh, discussing whether or not we should be looking at the 25% uh, of the harbor dredged every decade or whether or not there needs to be one big, uh, let's get the harbor caught up and, uh, and then move into the, the maintenance. Is there any of sort of feeling on that at this point? There is, uh, both ways. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. I mean, they've up uh, so far, it's been planned to do it in like four different stages. Right, right. Significant dollar amount to do it in one. Yeah, the, <coughs> thanks to Jim Starkey, and I think I've got this number right, Mary, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the number to finish off the harbor, uh, get it all dredged in the next run is about six million dollars. So now, uh, just so everyone knows, the, the state does now actually have a grant <coughs> program for dredging. Uh, of course, it depends on how many harbors are planning projects and how much is available in the pot, but the state will fund 50% of a project up to Two and a half million dollars. So that would leave 4.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 3.5. 
a painfully large number. 50% up to 2.5, you said, so 50% of the 2.5, so one recording? Oh, no. Well, no, they so if we have a $5 million project, they right. would potentially give us two and a half. So that would leave three and a half for us. Mm -hmm. and one of those discussions going to be continuing? Uh, I could reschedule another dredging meeting. We sort of left it open. But yeah. I know one of the concerns is being able to just mobilize the whole harbor for this with all the moorings and movement. So mm -hmm. I'd have yeah. to be maybe split over two seasons we were sort of talking about. Right. Try to catch it within a year. Right. So the, the permits are kind of a big deal. Uh, there's one, our, our suitability permit, which is the permit that says you can dump offshore. It's only good for three years. Mm -hmm. uh, so part of the discussion was if we are permitted, could we do half of the, the whole harbor, remaining harbor, one year, and then a year off, and then the following year, the last year of the permit, finish it. That was um, working with the, the, you know, the confines of the permits, but doing it in one permitting cycle. You would, all, this, would this be all about the glass head, or is this just to like the aqua? This would be the entire uh, from Can Five at the end of the channel, all the way in Proctor Cove, Whittier Cove. Um, so you're talking the entire length, the around the edge of area uh, three or area C, and then right in here at the town docks as well. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the entirety of the remaining uh, dredging. So the financial models for that, for the dredging projects in town were, were kind of designed around waterways fees and yes. potentially grants. And this mm -hmm. doesn't fall within the parameters of that model. Right. FinCom mm -hmm. taking a crack at this yet? Not, not directly. Um, I mean, it, I think like anything, if there's significant savings that could be achieved by trying to do it um, in a short period of time, that would be worth talking about. Um, so. so what are the time frames for the um, dredging committee and HAC making real decisions that affect or require? Um... I have to move fairly quickly because uh, we're already into the next round of uh, engineering permitting uh, for dredging. Uh, some initial work has been done, survey of uh, the harbor bottom so when you we say build the permits, will, we will be finished with that process for a couple of three more years. Oh, at least. At least, right. So the reality, from my perspective, it was seven years to get permits to do this last dredging. Mm -hmm. So we're talking six years, five and a half years from now, before we could potentially um, have a uh, contractor here in the harbor. But you have to start on... <clears throat> Whatever it is you plan, got to make a time frame. Got to make a decision on the approach. Two or three years down the line, and then say, "Well, we're going to do this versus that." You have to make that decision well in advance, then, right? Right. So, the engineering was uh, around two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in permitting for this last dredging project. Um, yeah. That. I, I think that the uh, dredge committee, HAC, would need to uh, have a recommendation uh, before spring. And how does that 600 fall out from a cash flow standpoint? So 225 for the survey. engineering and permitting. That's what in the first, first year or two? Uh, that was, that's the total cost. That's what it cost us from oh. 2011 until the project, project wrapped up. That's what we paid the engineering for. But on a six-year budgeting planning process, mm -hmm. how does the how does the total spread out? Uh, the majority of it probably is in year two and three. Uh, the um, sediment testing is the most expensive piece uh, when they're taking our soil and water and putting it in with marine critters to see how long they live. Uh, the, to make the decision for the dumping offshore. And that's year two and three, and then uh, permitting will be the next most expensive thing. 
the survey at the bottom is sort of uh, the hydrographic survey is <coughs> the low end, and that's where we are right now. But so, 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 so the six six hundred is that what the total cost is? Or, or did I just hear that? Two two hundred twenty five thousand for the engineering and permitting. From oh, so the whole project is six million. You said the whole project is six million. So the majority of that's going to be uh, back end. Is going to be the uh, mobilization, demobilization, and contracting. That's all going to be on the back end. That's the last. That's years. What? Six and four, seven. Four, five, and six. Five, or? right. Five, six, six, seven, four, five. Yeah. What is the biggest advantage to doing it all at one time as opposed to as it's been done? So you pay for one round of engineering and permitting instead of two or three. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I guess I always kind of envisioned when I was thinking about the harbor, it was way behind. So maybe three to get it uh, caught up. Uh, I, I, we've done one, next one in five or six years, and then the engineering and permitting starting my last year on the job mm -hmm. in Manchester, uh, the seventh year, and then uh, construction four or five years down the road from then. But there would be significant significant cost savings uh, to do it all at once. Uh, one round of engineering and permitting, one round of uh, mobilization and demobilization. That is no small number to get that equipment in here and out of here. Is, is there like a federal waterway or FEMA grants or anything? There is no, we are not an FNP. The Army Corps is never going to make us a, an FNP. They right, are thrilled that we're not. FEMA programs to improve? No. The, the state grants probably are. Right. Probably our only shot. Yeah, state grant and, and uh, what we say through the waterway fund. Or, okay. yeah, what's the current maximum draw of a boat in the Army? So uh, the last round of dredging, we uh, so dredged through the coming through the upper channel. Right. So uh, it was dredged to eight feet. Um, there are areas in the harbor where it's as much as eleven. It really depends on where you are. The spot right at Glass Head, where yeah. the sand mm -hmm. keeps going across. Uh, we have some of our larger sailboats that report at low tide. It's very thin. <laughs> so what's the estimate on what it is at glass head at like a low? Uh, so if we have a mean lower low, seven feet. And what's the rate of silting, do you know? Uh, it's, it's gotten greater since I've been here, uh, the rate of silting. Uh, it's going to depend on winter storms. Those mm -hmm. winter storms. I, I don't think that these October storms helped us any. But if we were to, if we were to let's say we were, we were agreed to start today, like the whole thing's not going to be touched for five, five or six years, right? Right. So at that rate of five years of silting, what where would that leave us, even if we were to start today? Right. So I think that the channel will continue to silt in pretty regularly at a pretty significant rate. So uh, like a foot a year, or a no? Year? Well, it could be, but certainly. Uh, Three inches would be you know, an unreasonable number to think about. Mm -hmm. so four years, you, you lose a foot. So if it's low at seven, did you say? Six, yeah. Six, seven? So yeah. Like we could lose two feet by the time you start dredging if we started today. So you're down five feet low tide at glass end. Potentially. Yep. Potentially. Uh, what I sort of envisioned if, if this is done in 10 year increments, uh, no matter where you dredged in the harbor, probably the investigation and likely dredging of that portion of the channel with every uh, round of dredging to keep that, that part of the, the channel from filling in in between. And, and what if nothing is done? What if nothing is done? <coughs> uh, well, there's, if you go over to the First Parish Church or over to the Historical Museum and you look at that great aerial photo from 1934, mm -hmm. 
certain nice sailboats are going to be lying over on their side in the mud um, in half a century. And that's a significant loss of uh, revenue. <laughs> it is. It is. If you care about trying to keep the harbor navigable and right. you know, supporting the, the two boat yards mm -hmm. and the businesses downtown that benefit from uh, the transient boaters. Yeah. What's a, what's a commercial fisher, fisherman boat draw? So uh, the uh, largest one draws uh, just over five feet. So that would be touching in two years if we did nothing. I mean, that would be touching in four or five years if we did nothing. Mm -hmm. Potentially. Potentially. Okay. Well, good to, uh, actually, I'm, you know what, I'm, gonna, um, I'm, I'm actually not going to let, um, take on a public comment on this right now, um, because I want to get through the full report, and I don't want to run this too That's, that's pretty good. much it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I really want the wall at the end of Beach Street to be considered because it's going to flood. That's just a fact. The wall at City Beach. Those By Dusty's. Oh, you know. Dusty's. It's going to flood. Yeah. It will. <laughs> <laughs> that's a harbor consideration, it seems to me. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a larger issue that I have spent a lot of time thinking about indeed. as well. Yeah, we have, we have a whole host of, <laughs> a whole host of challenges from <laughs> sea level rise and storms, absolutely. Okay, so um, then we'll be hearing, uh, you said recommendations from the Harvard Committee on Boring is in, you said, was it January? January, January. And uh, on the dredging side, when we'll be yeah, uh, I would say probably not too long after that, uh, maybe February or March, depending on when the, the Dredge Committee meets again and makes a recommendation for the HAC to recommend to you. Well, what will the nature of their request be at that time? <clears throat> probably, I'm, I'm going to guess it's probably going to be a request for an increase in uh, waterway fees. Again, uh, so the two that we've had since I've been here targeted directly uh, the cost of dredging. Uh, and, uh, and also I would suspect that a dredging cycle recommendation would be made, whether or not it's going to be one fell swoop or two fell swoops under one permit or uh, one project and then a second completely separate project. And with the accompanying uh, appropriation of any type for town meeting in spring? Not for dredging at per se, not this year. Well, more engineering costs. Well, more engineering costs, right, as part of the... Yeah, to be ongoing engineering. Right. Engineering costs uh, commensurate with whatever plan they're recommending. All right. Well, there you go. <coughs> um, Two small questions when you're done. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you done? Uh, you mentioned two additional docks at Tux Point. Yes. Where are you envision those gone? Face on the face uh, of the floats now. Uh, if you were to look at the Tux Point docks right now, there are the two that belong to MSA. Mm -hmm. If we were to put two more where the MSA floats are and then extend those towards the Yacht Club, now the Yacht Club is. Uh, the folks that I've spoken with, I haven't gone up and, and been to a meeting, but <clears throat> anything that might try to encapsulate and keep swimmers and beach people away from uh, where the launch is back out. Um, the Yacht Club's starting to face some real challenges with the uh, uh, silting, getting the launch in and out of there. Mm -hmm. And at low tide sometimes, those people coming off the beach wade nearly out into where those launches back out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I would just recommend that I'm less concerned about the Yacht Club, more concerned about residents who use Tux Point right. as a as a scenic area. I would just right. make sure that you have a sufficient public input right. on whether or not people mm -hmm. may, may not use the dock, whether or not they appreciate 
docks stretching southward mm -hmm. off the rotunda because that, that would be a, mm -hmm. a significant change to the visual landscape. Mm -hmm. While I appreciate docks personally, <laughs> not everyone does. Not everyone does. <laughs> so that nope. would be that would be a pretty dramatic change visually. So I would just no make sure you, uh, mm -hmm. no no pile no, yeah. no pilings be recommended. I don't think people would be used to that, and yeah. that doesn't mean you don't do it. I right. just think you should mm -hmm. for your own. Mm -hmm. Welfare. Could one go north and one go south? Uh, you couldn't because of the morning field. <laughs> you'd be, you'd, 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 you'd have to find it. You've already got one boat now. You could, at some times on mean lower low tide, step from the dock onto the transom. <laughs> uh, where is where is the uh, the proposed uh, trailer ramp at Tex Point? Where, where where would that go? So. Don't know uh, when I when I look at Tux Point. However, uh, if you're standing in the little circle looking at the Charter House, mm -hmm. off to the left, mm -hmm. there's a place where people go down over the bank uh, and hike along the shore or throw sticks for their dogs. Um, That's marsh, though. Can you mess with that? It isn't. It isn't. It's right, actually, in the basin that's been. Uh, dredged in the past okay. for uh, what's now the McHugh property. You know where the dumpster is down that? Down the bank from there. Yeah. yeah. It looks like it once was. It, it has. Yeah. It was it once marsh. But it, it, oh, it, I mean, now. not marsh. It looks like it once yeah. was a lot. Well, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's a degraded area. I'm sure actually. You're the environmental concern. Right. It's, it is degraded because <coughs> of the, the traffic over the bank right there. So uh, our ramp could potentially alleviate and provide uh, access for potentially the yacht club uh, with uh, some one design, smaller boats, fleets of smaller boats, and our kayak boats mm -hmm. in town. Mm -hmm. It's not envisioned as a, a, a ramp like we have back here for large vehicles and, and trailers. I have one question. Yeah. Um, on the Reed Park Dock, you mentioned that uh, um, money left in the federal grant to allow the installation of power for boaters. Right. Um, is that uh, plan going forward? And if so, is that um, a metered cost? Or is it just a plug there that anybody can plug into? Right. So uh, there hasn't been any discussion to bring a recommendation forward yet on that. There is money left over. From the grant which we use to pay for 75 percent of the cost of uh, these power posts uh, these power posts you see at marinas the yeah. yacht club has a couple and also uh, put the water spigots on there and you can meter them more commonly uh, what happens is uh, a facility will charge an increased rate per foot to, so it's uh, just built into the fee. It's built into the fee. Everybody pays it, um, but it, it covers the cost of um, the electricity and the water actually it more than covers it. So would we then be getting the cables for the hookup and providing those? And we'd, we'd hire an electrician to install those posts and a plumber. I mean the cable that goes from the Oh, no, no, that, the, the boater brings okay. us. That's, uh, okay. they, that's their gig. <laughs> So this would not be available to the one hour boater? Uh, not with the current fee structure that we have. Doesn't mean that it could not be. Uh, just with the current fee structure um, at $8 an hour flat rate, I suppose we could consider it, but um, most people coming in for an hour wouldn't, or two hours wouldn't plug in unless they were in a desperate way. And most of those folks coming in are, are running a generator. A lot of times the, the uh, shore power is used to, in, in lieu of a generator running on your boat all night long, keeping you awake, <laughs> potentially killing you with carbon monoxide poisoning. Keeps the air conditioner going all night. Right, precisely. Any other questions? Good. All right. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Thank very you very much. Thank you very much, Brian. I'll see you in a couple of months, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We won't see you tomorrow night. Yeah, I'll be there. That's right. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>
couple hours. Yeah, yes. exactly. Oh, uh, before I go, um, town uh, employee pizza lunch Wednesday. I sent you all an email. You should feel free to come over to First Parish Church and have homemade pizza. When did you send the email? What is today? Thank you. All right, back to item four, our grant of an Eastland to National Grid for New Conduit for Memorial School. Greg, do you want to summarize this? So the new school needs uh, new power to be brought in. Um, unfortunately, they can't come off of Summer Street because the power along Summer Street is inadequate. It would be the shorter run. <clears throat> so they're proposing to come off of Lincoln and looking for a fairly long trench to wrap around the um, come along the, the driveway and then come into the back side of the new building. Um, total length is just under a thousand feet. Um, and so as, as owners of the property, this is town owned property, um, National Grid is looking for you to grant an easement. You're allowed to grant such an easement um, as long as it's under a thousand square feet um, threshold. Um, and this squeaks, squeaks under that. Um, so the request is for you to uh, sign off on the easement. And they're, uh, they're intending to do the work this fall. They are hoping to get it done before ground freezes here. So where are they going to actually do all that if the kids are schooled in session? So they timed the digging where the, um, so it's not interfering with starting uh, exiting a school. Whether or not they they do it, or, um, you know, on weekends or mm -hmm. after after the kids are gone. Well, I, I, they, they probably will do some of it during during school or when the kids are inside. Does require them to come back for a public hearing? No, it doesn't. <clears throat> so it is different than a, than a right of way public hearing. It's not cross wetlands. Um, well, so they're proposing an overhead from pole to pole, which is where potentially is some. The dark line is an overhead? Yes. Yes. 18 1 is a new pole. Um, mm -hmm. and there was some conversation about. Can the pole go? Mm -hmm. can, can they, well, can they, can they put that underground as well? Um, Is it, do they do they deal with if the, is, is there has anybody checked the, the environmental consequence? Yeah, that's well, we have that. That is their um, their responsibility. So with that pole, pole eighteen, which dash one, which is a new pole, um, is that you said that they're talking about possibly doing that underground? No. I raised a question Jeff, with Jeff Greg earlier question. this afternoon about yes. this, mm -hmm. um, because what you've got is a pole and 162 feet of, of hanging wire mm -hmm. in a forested area mm -hmm. um, with plenty of potential given the storms that we've had for power outages to the school. And we don't want them cutting those down. But, no, it's not even a question of cutting those down. But I didn't. I hadn't thought about at this point that. Uh, that this area was of great controversy on the other side of the driveway when they went to build the mm -hmm. uh, tennis courts about wetlands and issues related to wetlands and whether this uh, whether this is a wetland area and whether that would make it significantly more challenging to uh, to do uh, conduit in the ground. Which so. is maybe why they're proposing a pull again. Right. Uh, maybe you know, it's much more convenient and cheaper for them. Uh, if I agree with Jeff, if they don't have if they don't have to suspend this, why would they? Well, and if so, then why why don't they go out the parking lot if they're gonna start ripping stuff up? Mm -hmm. Straight out north or not north, but uh, east. East. Yeah. I guess what it's just curious why 
was this not looked at in the beginning of the project? Which? For the new school, where to run the power line? Well, I think it was. This is this. You know, they're getting around to the paperwork on it. I feel kind of uh, strong, hamstrung here, without having a national party representative to answer questions about this whole position as opposed to um, running it, running the conduit on the Lincoln Street and over to the school. Um, so we, we can ask them to come on the December 2nd meeting. Well, would they be able to go forward then? I mean, doesn't that get into the time of... of, of yeah. 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 So some of the question is this the only option because it just seems like take it or leave it, but mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't make complete sense maybe for the town. <clears throat> so it's not going to be a low low voltage wire either. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is pretty hefty duty. That's going to be a pretty serious wire. <clears throat> does seem like they have some uh, relatively weighty questions um, just so we understand what are the consequences of them not completing their work in the fall and it is pretty tight for them to complete the work because um, they have to crack the road and close it back up right mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if they don't do that if they have to wait till the spring what ends up happening yeah, so I don't know the details of that. Well, they would only need to, as you say, crack the road if we asked them to drop the cable and get rid of the pole. That's true. <laughs> um, All right. I, um, I, I can't believe looking at this map if it's drawn to scale, Greg. Not right, the, say. That this line right. over, over to pad 18.2 is 1,000 feet. Yeah, they, they say it's not the scale. So, right. um. <clears throat> School building committee was uh, as part of this uh, part of the project. They're informed, they're aware of this aspect. Right. right. Um. Well, I think it sounds like there's pretty strong feeling that we need a little bit more information. So let's let's. And oh man, well it's somebody else in national grid, right? That's yes. Yeah, I think it was the lady we had earlier. Oh, that thing is all the way to feed pad 18-2. Yep. Wow. Right. That's a long and wandering road. Yeah, it's a That's it's an 800 foot long. <laughs> you can draw a longer line if you try. Yeah, it's exactly. Is there a reason, do you know, Greg, that they specifically want it to go that way? Is it for accessibility if need be? Is that why they? Well, in terms of, I mean, it, it's a, so where 18.2 is, that pad, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the best place for it in terms of the building function, flow of kids and all of that. And they don't want to go under the proposed parking lot and Okay. Or under the building. Or under the building. Right. That's it because of accessibility. Right. Mm -hmm. right. They weren't able to come off of Summer Street. Well, I would ask them why they don't bank east off of MH 18 1. Right. Go down the driveway to the. And they could even, actually, they could even cut into the grass if they didn't want to cut up the, the pavement. Mm -hmm. 
There's no pavement there. Well, well, no, there's the parking lot, and then there's the tennis course. But there's there, I thought there is a grass strip between the tennis court and the pavement. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I'm getting into there is. There is. There is. I'm not an engineer, so I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's any shorter. Well, with the way they're drawing this line, I don't, clearly don't care about distance. <laughs> <laughs> Why were they not able to come off Summer Street? You didn't have the power. Resources. The power is inadequate. Okay. So they upgraded the power on Lincoln when they did the high school. Still at Lincoln. Excuse me. Still at Lincoln in the East. Okay. Yes. Yes. No, no. All right. Plus, you know, yeah, this, the notion of a suspended power line in 2019 is we should be doing everything possible to bury these things. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's try and bring them in for December 2nd and let's. Uh, <clears throat> I think it might be a good idea to get somebody from the school building committee out too. move on to item six preview of fall town meeting <clears throat> try to expedite this I did try out the, the one in the articles if you need them uh, and there was a separate separate attachment I apologize for the multiple attachments yeah so nothing in particular has changed um, uh, we discussed who was going to speak on the different articles last time um, Article one, there's Steve Gang. Mm -hmm. We'd ask Steve Gang to uh, talk about this. Yeah. 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 He's prepared to do that. All right. And Article two. Uh, just just in, in, in the motion for Article one, I just highlight that, reserving to the board. Yep. The right. That was the language suggested by yeah. Right. That was the town a, council. The town council then. Talking to ConCom after consultation with that. <clears throat> Where does ConCom stand on this? They're, they're, they're supporting of this. No. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Article 2. Um, <clears throat> CPC will be talking about that one. Correct. Article 3. Um, Arthur, you were out, so we volunteered you. No, I won't. Well, you find yourself a You never give up the opportunity to speak. It's not good. Um, and Oracle, Article 4 and 5 are going to be taken together, and I was going to speak on those, and I'm still writing my notes on those. Um, I did note that I went from Becky Jakes to Becky Jakes in Article 5. Where? What? I said I went from Becky Jakes in Article 4 to Becky Beck. Jakes. But that's okay. I don't want yeah, that. Yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's all good. Who's Jake's this friend? That works too. As long as there's no C in Jake's, I'm all right. So this is just a draft of a handout for Article 4 and 5. So I'll take a quick look. Some information from the um, Haverhill and Digester. Um, so they they don't accept curbside compost direct. You can um, collect it and grind it and then deliver it to them. Um, and they would charge between thirty five and forty dollars a ton at their at their um, facility. So you have the cost of. So you have the cost of collecting and grinding, grinding mm -hmm. and, and trucking up to, to Haverhill. That's prohibitive. That would be prohibitive. Yeah, that would be prohibitive. Uh, they actually have a, a site tour of, of, of Brick Airs and Black Earth and the Haverhill Digester today that Chuck was able to go on. Uh, that DEP sponsored. Okay. 
So which which is scenario? So which is the scenario? Two. So scenario A is if the waste management did it for us. Um, scenario B is what we currently are doing with Black Earth, and then scenario C is what they're proposing would be the. the um, so they're seeing is what they're proposing the, the new facility um, numbers would be. But it assumes volumes are, are staying the same as they are today. Would they be, um, would Black Earth <clears throat> be equipped to handle more if people that were yes. to increase? Yes. Is it, it significantly so? Does it, is that a. Right, so we would stipulate that they would have to always uh, reserve the capacity for our compost needs at this facility. Um, so the, the new one is, is conservatively estimated to be 50 tons a week, processing 50 tons a week. Mm -hmm. um, we're currently generating less than five tons wow. a week. With him? The new facility will handle conservatively. I think they think they're going to be able to get more out of it, but conservatively, it's, it's rated at five, 50 tons a week. Yeah. And currently, we're generating less than five, five tons a week. So I think one so thing. So if we went up to full participation, we would be closer to 15 tons a week. But only, is it only true that only 30% of the town compost? Right. Mm -hmm. So we plan to increase the amount. Town compost? We're hoping to. Yes. Yes. And how are we going to make people do that? <laughs> Charge well, more for the garbage bag. Stand in their kitchen. We're going to penalize them into compost. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it costs us. We have to pay for that. If they if they're not composting, we pay more for the garbage removal. So every year, waste management will increase their fees. We'll get the total bill for what that's going to cost, and then we make decisions about how we're going to fund that. In over the past several years, we've raised the fees on trash bags to account for that. And it's not that we're going to be oh, necessarily yeah, yeah. trying to penalize people into composting. It's that we're going to um, recover our costs for the increase. In yes, the trash bags recover our costs, I understand, but the, raising the cost of trash bags to shift behavior is different. Well, um, uh, I, I think that... Because uh, we're only saving $20,000 a year in the two scenarios, B and C, correct? 26? Yeah. But we're paying 300000 But it could go up if we had more people composting as opposed to... But this is where I kind of... This is where I'm kind of losing <clears throat> steam on the argument because we're spending 300000 to get an incremental 26,000 in savings with the assumption that we're going to shift behavior to a higher percentage from 30%. But that's not just it. Well, that's part of it. That is part of it, if we could. That's but not the town, game. Are we, do we really want to be moving into behavioral economics so <laughs> as a town? Oh. <laughs> so there's a $300,000 in downtown money we spend. It's also our anticipation that the waste management costs are going to continue to rise. That I don't debate. I, I, I'm not saying that we don't do something. I'm just saying our solution seems to be to address cost controls while moving into an exercise of human behavior management. No, I'm not suggesting that at all. I don't I'm not, I was doing I'm not that. saying that you personally suggest I'm saying that I just think we need to be prepared at town meeting floor to address this point. I'm not necessarily going to be the one that raises this point, but $300,000 is a lot of money. And it's in a private enterprise. And I think we just need to be prepared to answer to that. Because the, the annual budget, I guess my problem all along is that the annual operating savings is not dramatic. It's 26000 between B and C. But the capital outlay is significant. Right, but what, what scenario B doesn't show is that we can't keep operating right. the way we currently are sure. operating. We, we would have to put some investment into what we're currently doing as well. So it's not yes. zero. It's not zero versus three hundred. Um, the, no, we, I, there's no debate that we need to do something. It's just, 
as long as we feel extremely comfortable that this is the absolute only alternative. Otherwise, I think we just have to deal with the optics. Because op if you look at the raw numbers, the optics aren't necessarily good while recognizing the problem that we sit on is even potentially worse. I'm not dismissing that whatsoever. But as long as we're prepared, because I think it's a fair counterpoint that we, that I think, as a town, we need to be prepared to answer for. Because I, you know, I don't know if we've ever spent three hundred thousand dollars on a private enterprise. Yeah. Um, does it pay for itself in ten years? I don't know. Well, at 26, yes, you know, and it's the right way ecologically. You know, it's a it's a right direction. I think that's a selling point. It's paid for in 10 years. I mean, that's the way we're going on our solar panels. <coughs> you know, same idea. Yeah, I, I just I I very I'm not a fan of public funding of private enterprises. Mm -hmm. And the one assumption that is out there is the management of this operation. If it's going to be at a capacity of 50 tons, you say, mm -hmm. and we take up five, that's a huge gap of other towns using the facility. What happens to this facility is out of our control to some degree. And we're a funder of this operation. So the payback may be there for us on paper. But we're investing in an operation that is quite significant. And I just want us to be prepared for that because we're not in the management business of. of well, in scenario C, tip fee royalty that kicks in at year eight is from other towns bringing their stuff to us. Yes, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm just. The scale of this operation could get very large, and, and are we aware of what we're effectively investing in? Even if it does end up being cash flow positive for us after a period of time, we may be dealing. I'm just, mm -hmm. just preparing us for questions. Oh, well, that's good to do. Because the scale of the operation will be much bigger, significantly bigger. What's the current capacity of, of where we do it today? Less than five tons? Um. No, it's a little more than that. Um, so it's handling 10 to 30 percent of the town plus plus a bit of landscapers coming in. Yeah. Um, I, guess a, it, it, I think it's a point that may get raised. I, um, and I just want to make sure we're prepared for it because there's the economics of it and then there's the actual living with the facility once it's built. And um, I don't know if we have much experience in that. So we just may need, may need to address that. And is all the oversight or, or um, those types of concerns that Arthur's bringing up, are those addressed in the contract? So they certainly can be. I mean, that contract hasn't been negotiated right. yet. So, um, well, there's definitely service levels that we want to make very friendly to us because there, there are facilities that have been shut down because of things like stench and, and pest control. And we need, you know, if, we're, if we invest in this, like to the tune that we are, we're going to be a, basically, if this was a equity table, we would be a third owner, one third. Um, and we're not, we're, we have no voting rights once this thing is <laughs> built. Right, so our voting rights in that's exactly right. Exactly. Right. So we should definitely take a look at facilities that have been shut down of a similar nature in other parts of the country. Oh, well, could you grab a microphone so they can be heard? Um Morgan Green Finance Committee. Um, quick question, isn't the, the nature of this warrant article, the two parts, is basically to, number one, authorize money, and number two, to give the Board of Selectmen the authority to go ahead and prepare a contract mm -hmm. for correct. this. 
<clears throat> and presuming if a contract that's amenable to both parties doesn't get created, everything would stop. Mm -hmm. That's also correct. Yeah. So, I mean, what we're really, I think, asking the voters to do here is to allow a step to proceed forward to investigate creating a contract and, and, and the money if the contract gets written. And so, um, I just wanted to be clear on that. All right. Any other discussion or comment? How does the yearly cost savings to the town come out to be 128000 compared to the scenario A? So the net cost being twenty six, right? Because of the revenues that are generated. So in that scenario, part the the payback is three years. I I, I understand that. I, uh, I'm well. I'm challenging two things. One is. Do we really need a payback? If if we're you know if we're if the value of this payback nets us twenty six thousand dollar incremental gain in savings? No, twenty six thousand net cost. Yearly cost savings to the town. I'm looking at it from an operating standpoint versus the capital expenditure standpoint. Okay, but if you look at one hundred fifty four thousand five hundred against 26,000 yeah that's that's net cost to the town under what we do now and what would happen if we did this proposal and uh, but to, I guess and I'm all of the revenues yeah, yeah. that are product, uh, proposed would come through my, my, you, my position is how eight thousand a year that we're saving right and my position is I would rather actually take less savings and avoid the entire risk of a town investing in a private enterprise and getting involved in the management of uh, an infrastructure that is serving multiple towns with a capacity of 50 tons. To me, that's actually opening up a whole can of liability that we're not calculating. So if we don't do this, if we don't do this, then the other option, I mean, because Black Earth can't stay where they are Right, so then if we don't do this, the option is just stay with waste management or, or another collector? Right, or, or, uh, or does Black Earth find another home? That's what I'm, yeah. yeah. I don't know, it, it seems to me that there's just too, much, <coughs> too many upsides to the risks that you're well, we've already voted on so i think we're we're it's going before the town i i'm not arguing to rescind because there are other <laughs> ups, there, are, there are other upsides <coughs> i'm just trying to make sure we're not I, talking about which yeah. is that it frees up the land at the current site right we're, and and that's land that we desperately need to try and deal with town facilities i'm not seeking to reopen the discussion we already had uh, out of respect to you I, I i just want to make sure on the town floor out of respect for this body that we are fully prepared for all the counts counterpoints mm -hmm. because I think there are going to be a lot of people who look at this and think very critically about the way that taxpayer money is spent and I just want us to be well versed in all facets whether we whether for or against so that we're just presenting the notion that we looked at this holistically which is wise <laughs> because we have a lot of smart people in town and mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying what you're saying is wrong. I, I, I see what you're saying, and I, I see the merits. I, I just personally have a different view, but that's not for the discussion tonight, which is just about... No, but you're right. It is good prepared to have, you know, to, to, to not just go in looking at it with rose-colored glasses, but with nice, clear spectacles. All right. <clears throat> I want to move on to the uh, budget discussion. Unless anybody else has any compelling or different point to make from this topic. Compelling? <laughs> okay. Um, budget discussion. Great. 
take it away. So we'll get into the details of the preliminary budget um, on December 2nd, but I think it's worth um, touching base on, on at least the global issue of what is considered um, sustainable slash reasonable from, from an annual tax hike perspective. Um, so certainly over the last, well, ever since I've been here, um, been operating on the assumption that while voters uh, certainly guard their dollars carefully, that for the most part people have seemed um, satisfied with an annual tax increase that's in that two to two and a half percent range. Um, and they've dipped into their pockets deeper. They've done a, a school override and they've approved um, some significant debt, new debt, in particular with the most recent school board. Um, so, I just want to make sure, um, A, that if we're not comfortable with that assumption that two, two and a half percent annual increase is okay, um, if it's not okay, then what, what services do we want to target for savings? Um, because basically, it takes two to two and a half to continue what we're doing. Uh, I think we can continue what we're doing at that two, two and a half percent range. Um, certainly from an operating perspective, um, we will continue to struggle with, with capital, but we're doing much better than we were um, on the capital front. Um, and I think we, we can be pretty successful in our capital needs for the most part, barring catastrophic um, storms that wipe out lots of things, but anyways, um, obviously there's there's there are unknowns always. Um, on the other hand, two and a half every year means that you're doubling your taxes in fifteen to twenty years. Um, so that needs to be recognized as well. Um, we haven't, as a community, done a lot of put a lot of energy into growing our tax base. Um, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of hesitancy to do so in town. Um, though we did see some um, willingness, I think, in, in residents' mind that we could take a look at the LCD uh, on the other side of 128 to perhaps look at some expanded development. Um, but for the most part, I would say the majority of residents are not looking to grow our way out of some of our fiscal challenges. Um, so that's that's another tension point um, in, in how we manage our budget. Um, the, the department probably that challenges us most right now is fire in terms of staffing. Um, mainly because we have historically relied on a, on a very robust call force, and that call force has basically disappeared. Um, uh, you know, six, eight years ago, we had a call force in excess of 20 people. Now we're down to literally a handful. And is this just a national trend? It is a national trend. You, I think we're, we're, we've, accelerated, we've seen an acceleration of that, just because of our demographics, I think, in town. Um, you have a, a residential base that is not working in town for the most part. We are a bedroom community. The majority of people work outside of town. Um, a lot of people are taking the train to Boston. Or they're, they're, they're one way or the other fighting 128 to get to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so there's that element and there's the ever increasing um, stringent requirements for tall firefighters. Their training is, is much more rigorous. Um, not only initial training, but the ongoing training. So the, the days of throwing a guy, and it typically was a guy, uh, a, a coat and a hat and said, help us out, those days are, are gone. Um, liability issues alone require that we train them and make sure they know um, quite a bit about fire suppression and how to handle themselves in, a, in an active fire scene. Um, there are towns that continue to, to have a robust call force. Essex continues to do that. Um, 
though there are some who feel that their day will be coming too. Um, but, but to their benefit, they've been able to maintain it, and it's strong today. Um, so I'm uh, jumping around a little bit, but the um, fundamental question is how comfortable are we with the annual increase to 2.5% for operating? Um, and more specifically in terms of an operating budget concern is the staffing at, at the fire station. Um, they, they, the department, feels pretty strongly that they should be having four, four on at all times. Right now we have three on. Um, what? This is just a very odd question, but how effective and su successful do fire departments tend to be? They tend to be very successful in terms of what they accomplish. Um, certainly, as uh, from a medical standpoint, um, the um, ambulance services is highly regarded in town, and I would say it's it's highly successful. Mm -hmm. It can point to dozens of individuals who are walking around today, of which I am one, uh, because of because of their service. Um, so I'm not. I'm not arguing that. I'm no, not I arguing understand. any of it. I'm just. You know, it's. It's for the amount of money paid for a fire department. Um, and I, I understand what all has been explained to us about proximity and the different vehicle sizes and fire. Um, I'm just asking. Okay. So on uh, the fire fighting side, it's. It's, it's a much harder metric. I'd, I'd like to uh, make a comment here. We, we actually went through a lot of discussions over the past several years on this. And in fact, we went through these discussions last year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, another round. And we reached a, a compromise position that was um, argued long and hard with the FinCon and the board select went in the fire department, um, which we thought, and it was my understanding, that that was going to serve us for some time. Uh, and I think that was in constant uh, thought as well, right? So I'm a little bit uh, unhappy to hear it being raised again now. And I'm certainly not looking forward to a long round of discussions about the fire department budget this year. And that, that's my position right now. I don't think we should be moving again on the fire department budget, in particular after the discussions that we had last year on and preceding years. Because last year was my <coughs> understanding that we had reached a, a reasonable and sustainable compromise position to hold for the time being. And I particularly don't want to um, fiddle around with the staffing prior to bringing a new um, full-time chief on board and prior to the new full-time chief um, getting a feel for the town and for the um, fire department that that person would be overseeing. So I'm personally not supportive of making any substantive change to the fire department budget out of outside of a two and a half percent increase this year. What was it you said you're happy with a two and a half percent increase? That's that's where I would say, but I'm not looking to um, increase it beyond it. And what what um, um, Greg is talking about would require um, right. more than a two and a half percent increase, and this was beaten to death last year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would love to see a two percent. I mean, I just I'd love to see less. But um, how long have we been doing the two and a half override now? Ten years. Well, how long have we been doing the two and a half annually? You know. Long, long time. Long time. Long time. Since like Prop two and a half came along, yeah. roughly. Practically every town is running on that yeah. sort of a rate. It's kind of the, it's kind of the practical ceiling, right. and then you discuss going above it. So I, I just I, I agree with you, like, but I at the same time uh, feel like we are slamming a lid on something that is going to just lose out the side because the fact no matter what we do and I. See no evidence that police, fire, 
school districts, if anybody is guilty of mismanagement in any significant way, it's not an issue of people not spending wisely. It's an issue of the fact that these costs are rising at a rate higher than we want them to. <laughs> and, and the problem is that I think we can, and I agree with you live for, for the next year planning, I think that's the right way to go. But the reality is over the next five, 10 plus years, there's just some raw facts that we're gonna have to negotiate. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't, see how a town like Manchester or Essex on their own can sustain the quality of services that everyone expects, including myself, and be able to independently function to the, in the way that we historically have. It, it, mm -hmm. The math doesn't work. Um, and, I, and again, I, I think people are not going to give up the quality of the services. I don't support giving any changes to the level of services, but the fact is that, again, I, I think the combined emergency services is over 5% year over year. Uh, over the past three years, the school district, in, in, despite all the great work they're doing, is struggling to keep it, what, what, what's, where is it at now, or expected to come out this year? It's above 2.5% for sure, it's like closer, closer to three. Yes. Yeah, so, and, and people are doing, that's, Zero criticism of the work that people are doing. I, I think it's fundamentally um, an issue of whether or not the town can sustain this on its own. And, and uh, so that's why I was personally disappointed about uh, where we stand with the shared resources because it's not so much us giving up something as us finding a plan over the long run to be able to maintain these services because that's not going away. But our ability to operate them independently. I don't see it as something that we're going to be able to continue. And I, it's not, not, I'm not happy to be negative or a downer or anything like that. It's just, it's just mm -hmm. seems very, very difficult without taxes going up, which I don't think anybody wants. There's a boost this year to the school system revenue um, for the Manchester Essex Regional School District of something on the order of two hundred and forty to two hundred and sixty thousand dollars that's coming from the state um, in one year or over a seven year period. No, I think it was, I think it was in one year. That was, a, that's what it was not clear to me. That's <laughs> so, great. So the new, the new education funding, the new education funding, it's a $1.5 billion over seven years. Over seven years. But um, I think that the, uh, that the, when it broke down into annual budgets, that that's what they were talking about. I didn't know if that was the total after seven years or in year one. <laughs> no, I mean, I can follow up on that. Yeah, we'll find out. out. We'll find out. Yeah. That type of thing is fantastic news, but that, you know, that doesn't change the fact that organically we struggle. I, I understand. I understand. But one of the things that we need to do is we need to be going, as, we've, as we talk about a lot, but we don't get too much. Um, going to look at alternate source, sources of revenue. Um, and some of that is the underfunding of the schools um, by the state for many, many years. Um, and the state's trying to, trying to build that back in at this point, um, to some extent. Um, I think that uh, there's, a, there's a goal that we talked about in our last meeting of um, taking a careful look at land use and the LCD and conservation and an overall plan for land use. And that that needs to um, be continued um, to be in the forefront of our minds in terms of how we go about doing that because there is a possibility of revenues coming in that direction as well. Um, and we should start talking about it as possibilities and try and see if we can go beyond that to more concrete plans. Um, that will allow us to capture some of the uh, commercial revenue from the other side of what the highway needs to do. Uh, <coughs> any comments on the uh, overall on net, the specific question that Greg raised about two, two and a half percent? 
pieces of guidance. Um, it's the number that we've been using for some time and it's compatible with um, keeping our existing services and continuing our, our uh, capital investment in town. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I remain supportive of it. Uh, and certainly I don't see anything in this coming year to shift me specifically away from this. However, I will make the observation that there is, there is a suggestion from um, FinCon that we start um, uh, looking at our local receipts since we are underestimating them. So even if we do uh, propose a 2.5% increase, um, that's going to be mitigated, would be mitigated by um, <coughs> funding sources driven by, uh, possibly by using more of our local receipts. Correct? Correct. Um, I think there's just, we've talked about this, and um, there's a general recommendation that um, with the school override recently and sitting on pretty significant reserves that have been accumulating steadily over the last probably five, seven years, that um, being more conservative on receipts is a good thing. We talked about a multiplier of, I think, 0.8 on the average of the last five years. Um, this doesn't affect 2.5% increase much because that's mostly in operating and contracts, but there was talk about a recommendation for tax rate, maybe just pulling back on that a little bit for a year or two. Um, yeah, symbolic, well, however you look at it, but but we are adding to the reserves at a pretty significant rate through conservative receipt budgeting every year. And that number is, is climbing. And um, I, I think it would be better if it leveled off a little bit. I, I, I shouldn't say me, our, no, our whole finance committee thinks it would be better if it leveled off or came down a bit. Greg, what other um, <coughs> aspects of the budget are you looking for guidance on tonight? Um, uh, we don't need to go into a whole lot more detail at this point. I, mean, I would save it really for the December second presentation and then digesting that. Um, unless unless you feel that there are areas um, that are that need special attention. Um, so budgets as they have been coming in and sitting down with department heads for the most part, um, pretty much status quo. Um, DPW is, is asking the question as to whether or not um, we should be anticipating uh, what will be a fairly high uh, retirement rate in the next five or so years. And in anticipation of that, do we bring people out a little early to do some training and have some overlap? Um, so, as well as um, trying to do some more basic maintenance in house rather than always contracting out. Um, other than that, um, no other department is really looking at big changes. Are there, are there, um, I feel like when I first joined the selectmen, you know, Eli, particularly you and Greg and Lori, like had a really strong focus on those relationships between the capital projects that <clears> affected <throat> our, our budgeting, like, like I think about sewer and water, for example, and are there any traces of value to be extracted from further capital projects that can positively affect annual budgeting or operating costs, especially in DPW, for example? If we spent more on further investment in pipes and sewers, is there, is there any defined or calculable value in lower maintenance costs over a period of time? Can we make any of those arguments? Oh. Yes, you can, in terms of you know, line breakage and that sort of thing. Yeah. You know, sewer pump operations, all these sewer pumps are brand new now, and, and um, you know, so we're not gonna see emergency call-outs on those. Um, is there anything definable that we can calculate or estimate? Yeah, it's, um, i have to sit down and check and see if we can put some dollars to that. I mean, it just seems like while we have surplus funding, that we, I don't know where we stand with the list of projects, and because and, that would be, I hope that is something that we 
include as part of our budgeting, even if it's capital, we still look at it as part of the exercise of our right. annual budgeting. Oh, no, definitely. Um, but I am really interested in those projects that are not huge capital expenditures, maybe smaller dollar that somehow we can tie back to yeah. efficiencies and the annual savings. Because yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a very defensible thing to be spending money on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to be very hard pressed to argue with that. One. <laughs> um, actually, actually, any infrastructure that can be brought forward and paid for is going to be cheaper than it's going to be later. Six yeah. months. Two months. That is true. But then the because one... the, the rate of, the rate of contractor labor mm -hmm. and contractor costs is, is just skyrocketing, and we but, see that in, yeah. in yes. contractors not bidding on projects that we offer mm -hmm. because well, they're too small. But where we can yeah, where, where we can take that and double dip it with the fact that we won't be spending as much on DPW because there won't be as much to fix in theory, right? I mean, again, I'm not saying that that exists, that equation exists necessarily, but if, if there's a way to look for anything, I mean. Yeah. I mean we certainly certainly look at the capital list really, really carefully at the five-year level, and, and I would say our income is pretty, pretty tacked down about changes that come and go within that five-year zone and and when they come up we jump on it pretty aggressively so for example there was I think an acceleration of the work done um, in the Magnolia area on hydrants and whatever and that was slated on the capital list for like five or six years out and it was brought back and and accelerated and it, it, it makes good sense on the contracting front but it was a higher spend than we anticipated and, and it it didn't just fly through. There's a lot of talk about that. Um, I would say, Greg, I don't know, you can comment on this. I think the work that's been done on the I&I and, &I and the saltwater intrusion into the septic system has been huge mm -hmm. on a bunch of levels. And that, that was a problem that was hanging over our heads for a long time. And that's, that's gotten a lot better. Yeah, so well, it's, we're really at the end of, uh, end of that. Right. Um, yeah, we're no longer getting fish in the, in the sewer <laughs> So mm -hmm. uh, a significant amount of salt water no longer coming into that plant. Exactly. Um, and that does save our, our operational cost. Yep. Um, it's, it's much easier to keep that plant running at its at a higher efficient rate. Um, so I'll have to see if we can put together some real numbers that show some of that. Where are we on the, all, all that work you did, and, and you did and you did, I'm not, I shouldn't point to one person, but I felt like we had a lot of momentum about where we were with pipes and infrastructure. I know it's continued, I'm not saying it, <laughs> but I felt like there was a lot of a lot of attention to detail to where we there, stood. There was a lot of attention to detail initially, but a very, very heavy focus because there was a lot of very major yeah. work that was being done. So we are not seeing quite the same intensity. However, this year we have been we talked yeah. about the, the updates on Magnolia and Ocean. Um, and well, basically, what you saw was a real heavy emphasis to, to do the analysis yeah. <laughs> and the studies, and we've been now um, pretty methodically doing those projects. And, and so that's what you see in the, in the five-year plan. You see various projects laid out um, based on all of that. Is there a sense of what percentage we've achieved since that early analysis? Yeah, um, we, we can get that. Yeah, we can get that. I mean, on the I and I level, we're we're pretty much one hundred percent complete on that now. Mm -hmm. um, water line work, you know, what percentage are we at? Uh, I don't want to hesitate to guess, but I'll, I'll give a number. Um, and we've done some significant water line work, but there's yeah. a lot out there. <laughs> I, mean, I think one just one observation. We're obviously sort of trying to tweak the model and see what works better and. I think what two years ago, Greg accelerated the <clears throat> some of the pipe work significantly, yes. Yes. and the, the feedback from the town was um, yeah. so aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe we tested the limit of the right. What people can tolerate? Yes. Yeah. So. Yes. You mean in terms of disruption? Yes. Yeah. 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 We did one year where we did Pine Street and Pleasant Street and some work on Lincoln, and <laughs> at the end of it, uh, people were. 
Uncle. Yeah, yeah they're great uncles. <laughs> yeah. 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 On the flip side, you have a house fire. And that right. It goes both ways. So. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, can we move on to uh, next items? And anybody else have any other feedback on the budget? All right, consent agenda was board select the minutes of October 29th and November 4th. Did anybody have any updates for those? If they have not forwarded those already in, I would like to just yank those out and we'll move to the next one. So, uh, I do have some. To which ones? The 29th and the 29th. The 29th, all right. 29th comes out. We'll take those in the next one. Any updates from anybody to the November 4th? All right, can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda, which now contains the November 4th minutes? Moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> okay, correspondence. I have a final letter from Comcast regarding eligibility expansion for Internet Essentials. And uh, item 10, the town administrator's report. So speaking of capital and construction, um, water work is progressing pretty well on Magnolia Avenue. They should be wrapping that up um, by Thanksgiving, so by, by next week. Um, we, we'll move on to the uh, portion of Ocean Street. We probably will not do the whole length. We'll probably focus on the stretch along White Beach because there's no need for um, bypassing water to keep uh, houses hydrant, uh, hydrated. Um, but it's likely they'll shut down after that and then we come back in the spring. Um, and I, we have hope to see work on that um, Washington Sea Summer intersection get underway. The contractor has been fighting weather and finishing up some other projects and it's not likely that they'll get to that before, before winter comes and it may well be a spring project. So stay tuned on that. Um, in terms of um, intersections, the, the two main intersections, one here out front and then over at Beach and Union, um, there have been some modifications to the engineers had to tweak those uh, concepts a bit. Um, there's some additional fine tuning and working with the, the dip on that. We hope to have um, before you at your meeting on the second um, revised set of plans for you to, to review and, and hopefully give a green light to. Um, continue on with our recruiting for the fire chief position. Um, not getting a flood resume, but we do have some um, some promising ones that have come in. Um, and <coughs> bless you. We um, should be convening the uh, review committee in early December to start reviewing those. And the communications front, uh, Tiffany has uh, completed her first week, she's in her second week. And working on a, a newsletter, first newsletter that will go out with the December um, bills, the tax bills, um, putting new posts on um, social media sites. Um, so I didn't know if there was a particular area that, that you would like to see um, that you work on. Um, welcome your your thoughts on that. And don't have if you don't have a first top of your head right now, you can certainly send me an email or get in touch with me after, afterwards. Let me know. And we're working on uh, some internal staffing um, issues and also looking at some um, office rearrangements that we're still working through. Hope to have a um, plan on that to you in uh, the next meeting or two as well. That'll do me for my report. Okay. Any other matters that we have not discussed yet that anybody wants to make on that? In that case, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed?